Good afternoon, everyone. Bienvenidos a todos. Um, um, here are Lisette Diaz on Terra Montclair School District. I am the director for English Learners um, Plan Development and Instructional Supports. And, um, and here with me today is Sylvia Vargas. She is our amazing Parent Educational Center Specialist. And, um, and so I'm going to be presenting a little bit about our journey um, with respect to our POP. And, um, and I want to acknowledge and recognize the valuable contribution of Tony and Gabe um, through our project to inspire through our families. Um, we couldn't do any of this work without you. So thank you, thank you, thank you. So here we go. A lot about our district is captured on this slide. Um, we are the largest elementary school district in Southern California, not in the state, third in the state, but in Southern California. And so um, we strive to um, promote our diverse populations. We have 23 elementary schools, three K-8 schools, and six middle schools. As you can see, we primarily serve our low-income students. Um, we have 26% English learner, and then you can see um, we're 90% Latino. And so we have, um, you know, we're, we don't have a lot of diversity in our English learner population, but we are noticing an uptick in our Vietnamese English learner population and our Arabic um, uh, English learner population. So we're really blessed to see some diversity within that um, um, group. Um, we pride ourselves on many awards, like many of you as well, from your districts. <clears throat> so some of the highlights are uh, noted uh, below. We are really proud that we have three dual immersion schools, two are 90-10 Spanish models, and one Mandarin 50-50 model. So I'm um, really excited about how we promote multilingualism and biliteracy. We have for the last three years, and just give me a little overview, the biggest um, thrust of our work has been around implementing a multi-tiered system of support. And so we were blessed to be part of the California SUMS Initiative Grant, and we began a cohort implementation model. And um, through this effort, we've really uncovered inequities, as many of us have done over the years. In particular, this year has really exposed a lot of, of inequities, um, particularly with our at promise um, students, English learners, um, and then other diverse groups that are typically um, marginalized historically. And so, um, and so this work has really come to light this year specifically. And so um, we feel um, that the work that we've been doing for the last three years has really built up systems of social emotional learning and academic, uh, academic loss that has supported um, this very, very, very difficult year that we've all done. However, we, de we have had some positive growth from this year. And so we'll talk a little bit about um, what that has done, what, what our different systems of support are for our students. Um, so, you know, as all of you know, we have um, three different levels. In our, um, in our district, we work with our parents, our community partners, our teachers and staff, um, all stakeholders really to um, ensure that tier one supports are in place both for social emotional support and also academic support. And uh, we focus on early prevention and early intervention services, academic and social emotional. In tier two, we offer some case management support and mental health services that has been done since the uh, temporary school closure in March at 13th of 2020. Um, and um, we've really mobilized case management services because many of our community um, members were, were very, very impacted both um, through uh, loss of family members due to the COVID infection, as well as um, a strain, financial strain. Many of our family members are supporting the rest the types of uh, business sectors that were mostly impacted um, from the COVID pandemic, such as restaurants and um, different, different pieces like that. And so, and so that's really been, um, something that's carried us through. Um, and then also we have um, case management and mental health. Social emotional um, health has been a primary driver through this pandemic. Many, many of our family members um, and community members access these telehealth services. Um, that was one of our biggest challenges is getting the, as much support as possible to our families and community and student um, members. Um, so in, in terms of our team, um, our OMSD um, peer leading and learning team, um, it's made up of um, parents. We have our um, community member um, who represents the Mexican consulate of San Bernardino Riverside County. 
um, our administrator from Central Language Academy, as well as teachers and our teacher on assignment, and then members from our peer, um, parent educational center, our assistant soup, as well as um, our um, uh, director for um, family collaborative services and our Promise Scholars program. And so as we worked together to identify what is it that we're seeing, especially through this pandemic, we've identified, we had to have some courageous conversations and we identified that the problem of practice to overcome barriers to parent involvement lied squarely around issues of cultural proficiency in schools, districts, and the community as measured by um, the, and, and so how we would address this, how would we begin to, to peel back uh, these issues and really have courageous conversations and face the facts before us. Many of our parents felt that, um, as John alluded, um, um, didn't feel welcomed, didn't feel that many of our schools had a kind of a family welcoming space. They, they felt somewhat marginalized. I think, as um, John shared with his personal story, many of our families don't feel that they, um, I'll use the word in Spanish, abrigonzado, they feel kind of ashamed to approach, um, you know, teachers and school leaders. And so we're really trying to build in that cultural proficiency piece so that we can tear back those layers and um, really bring up that, that piece. Um, we created a five-year action plan um, this year, as well as um, a plan to really focus on cultural proficiency among all stakeholders. So um, when we identified these, you know, kind of looked in the mirror, we looked at it through the lens of six root causes of ineffective community engagement. And so these are research-based causes. And so we kind of coalesced around um, a lack of inclusivity based on race and culture. Um, you know, to be fully transparent, we really do have amazing parent involvement systems in our district. In fact, yesterday we just had our parent um, leadership conference and one of the and one of our parents was Davi Parent of the Year, and she did our keynote in Spanish. Like we, we really pride ourselves on these things, but at the same time, we really have to identify if stakeholders are still feeling this way, then we haven't gone far enough. And so that's why we selected our problem of practice around lack of inclusivity based on race and culture. Um, this year, we've also explored our um, black families and um, with the establishment of an equity group um, focusing on that particular um, group needs because it, we are 90% Latino and so we kind of almost sort of go that way but we really need to recognize that that's not our only culture that we represent. We have to really acknowledge that we are made up of diverse cultures and even though it's a small percent we really have to make an intentional effort to include race in that conversation um, in addition to the culture piece. So, um, so in terms of what we used or tools to develop our root causes, we looked at our stakeholder input, both for the um, learning continuity plan, as well as our LCAP, as well as a five-year action plan. And I'll talk a little bit about all those um, efforts that we did across the year. Um, and then we identified the root causes and um, we identified the root causes that we can address is the issue of race and cultural proficiency and building that up and, and then moving forward with the plan that includes staff professional development, including student voice counted into that, including family voice counted into that. So it's an, a robust effort. It's not something that's gonna be done right away, but we've already begun and I'll update you on some of those things that we started with. Um, so see, here's some of the factors that we've identified. So one, we do recognize that schools are absent of cultural proficiency across all their initiatives. They may have um, a parent involvement through the compliance piece, but we're not really seeing it through an internalized internalization of their curriculum or their pedagogy, um, uh, you know, just again, through the surveys that parents have, have provided us. Um, we want to identify a cultural proficiency research-based framework then create a plan around that so that so that students and families feel connected. We're um, using rubrics as identified through the MTSS process, um, like the FIA, um, so that schools can measure their progress towards um, inclusive education and addressing the cultural proficiency barriers. And then um, developing an awareness around it, um, creating that task force, and then guiding the development of that through the years um, and then monitoring whether or not we're, we're making progress towards that. I'll leave it in a minute for our um, families who would like to 
So, um, so we'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about what strategies we plan to use to overcome our POP, um, how they're cu culturally responsive, um, what buy-in we're going to include to create that buy that buy-in to overcome our POP, what's our timeline, and how what our outcomes to track our progress. And so we've identified um, our cultural proficiency goals. The stakeholder group did meet on November 12th of 2020, and we've, we've drafted our, our guiding documents. Um, again, as mentioned before, we're using our Fidelity uh, Integrity Assessment, or FIA, under MTSS to be able to monitor that, to track our progress. We're also utilizing the local educational agency self-assessment um, to track our progress. And then um, we, um, our board, um, our, our district actually took to the board um, a policy on equity this last past year. Um, and we've, we've included various stakeholders to ensure that perspectives of all are included in these draft goals. And so um, I won't read all of them but I'll speak to the one about family and community. So our family um, draft cultural efficiency goal is to foster the awareness of the family's culture while understanding, respecting, and appreciating the diversity and the cultures of others to benefit an inclusive community for all. And then our community cultural proficiency goal is implement a sustainable, culturally proficient learning environment where all district personnel support the academic, social, and emotional needs of our students and families by engaging in the wealth of diversity in our community. So like I mentioned, uh, getting there will um, take some time, but we've got at least a plan um, emerging with beginning with our goals. And there's the, our Spanish slide for our members. And I think you might also have access to that. Aquí está la información en español para los que no necesiten. Um, so how did different stakeholders engage in this process? Um, we, um, through the LCAP process, we've had quite a robust, and I'm sorry, I'm looking for my goals, um, part of, in part of a very robust parent involvement process. Um, throughout our year, we have consulted over 5,000 participants through online surveys in various forms. Um, we have repeatedly um, met with various parent advisory groups, our special ed parent advisory group, our DLAC, our district English learner parent advisory group, which is our two separate groups, our district parent group, our community advisory committee, um, our gate parent advisory group, our administrators, we've met with our, um, our bargaining units, teachers, and students. And so through the LCAP development process, we've also included um, input on cultural proficiency and how can we provide ensure equity among all our student groups. And so having this diverse range of perspectives has really strengthened this work. Um, it is again still beginning. The task force has met three times this year, um, but we our work is beginning and it has been a challenging year and we have so much happening in our district, but we felt it was that important to begin the process this year. Um, so I know that I wanna recognize the time. I wanna allow for some questions. Um, I have a question. Uh -huh. Hi, my name is Ruby. I'm um, from Power Valley Unified School District. I'm just curious about, um, have you all yet discussed or put out some type of a plan on how you will be uh, getting this out to all of the, like I'm thinking in particular like teachers and other school staff, is this going to be done through like um, um, professional development and like um, intentionally like I want to say mandated <laughs> you yeah. know I'm just wondering how you change the, those um, current like for many uh, current um, thoughts of, of, of our families and students uh, in that they you know in the deficit way you know they're thinking that how do you change that um, how you what are your plans Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I would say that this year has been more of a needs assessment, uncovering the inequities. Um, so we have now uh, African American um, administrator kind of staffing um, task force group that is um, beginning the work um, towards even kind of creating what that parent involvement group might look like. Um, looking forward to beginning the parent involvement group that represents that. 
group of students next year and communicating that. Um, our existing current advisory committee groups have also been, um, they're aware of the, the needs of cultural proficiency has been addressed at those levels. It has been cursory addressed, I would say, but we don't have a developed plan, which is what we're creating right now. We are looking at um, three different models and, and the team has not landed on which one yet. Um, but it, you're probably all familiar with um, Lindsay's work on the cultural proficiency, um, Holly's framework, and then there's also a document through um, New York City Schools that is uh, more of a practitioner guide that has each of the stakeholder groups. So our task force is looking at those three and trying to figure out which which, which framework or which research-based framework are we gonna launch from? And then after that, then there is a, a plan for develop for professional development with all staff, including classified staff. Um, and then there's a student piece because we want to have students um, develop advocacy for their own educational needs and cultural needs. We want them to feel that they're empowered and then a parent component. So th that's in development. And of course, then an, a, a, a comprehensive professional development rollout um, that will take place over, over a few years. We do have 20, over 2000 staff members. So it, it will take you know, some time to implement, like give you an example, MTSS has taken us four years. This next year will be our final year where all cohorts are through. Um, but there is, there, is a, there is that plan developed. It's not developed yet, but it's in progress of getting developed, but it will include all those factors. Thank you. That sounds wonderful. Thank you. Uh-huh. Any other questions? Hi, yes, I have. Go ahead, Liz. Hi, I'm Liz Guillen with Public Advocates. Uh, thank you so much, um, the set for the presentation. It was fascinating. Uh, and apologies for my little dog in the background. Um, the I wondered if um, stakeholders or you all had drawn conclusions or identified new problems as a result of the pandemic um, that you hadn't seen before and what they were. And that wouldn't necessarily be problems that hadn't existed, but just that they hadn't been identified. I'm curious about whether the pandemic actually helped to raise up or lift up issues that will serve your improvement efforts. Uh, absolutely. Uh, from the moment the from the from the moment those Zoom cameras turned on and teachers had an opportunity to see how our students' home lives are, um, and I get chills just even addressing many of the cases that we've had this year. It has exposed many of those inequities that are somehow washed over when all kids come to one place to learn. Um, so then the other piece that came out was um, the inequities where some, many of our families who are holding to, you know, the, the issues of poverty, really, many of our families are holding two or three jobs. Um, trying to find ways to keep a roof over their head and food on the table, really struggled with who was going to care for their children. And so, um, and so, you know, a lot of people in the community banded together to, you know, take care of each other's child, but there were cases where we uncovered and we had to send out um, wellness checks from the, um, you know, from our local um, police authorities and, and our own internal security and mentor system, get out in cars and do home visits because we would have a child report, you know, middle school student taking care of a, of a first grade student, you know, because the dad is, is working outside. We had, a, we had just a, a lot of basic needs um, that, that were gross, gross inequities. Um, and so there was a extra, extra efforts made this last year with nutritional services and in fact feeding community members um, 18 or under under the federal nutrition um, efforts, um, hotspots, you know, families with that hotspots, um, hotspots were purchased and, and, and distributed so that internet connectivity desks, even a place to work, you know, many families living really close and tight um, living quarters. So, you know, just even a, a place for a child to sit and, 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 and have their learning. Um, even things like desks were, were handed out. It was just kind of an all, 
all all hands on deck because we didn't know what we didn't know at the time when we launched into this and a lot was uncovered and um and mental health specifically mental health and social emotional big big needs and case management as well um uh pe peaked up i know sylvia's here with me um sylvia did you want to share and elaborate on any of those kinds of needs that came up through our parent yes so uh what we offered over at the parent educational center what we offered um many social emo emotional resources one in particular um healing circle uh circulo, Sana circulo sanador where parents just came and you know they just debriefed about the whole pandemic situation what they're going through other challenges and we just gave them that safe space to say we're here with you as a school as a community to work through these challenges with you. And so, um, like Lisette mentioned, you know, they did a lot of internal uh, through um, mentoring, going to the um, homes, uh, um, contacting authorities to check on these, on the kiddos, but we focused on the parents, on the community, you know, so we, we, we handle that piece and giving them just that extra support that they needed just to get past this, these moments of loss of financial, um, and security. So um, here at the Parent Center, we have continued to offer these um, these support groups and these and these classes that give these parents and our community the community the tools that they need to, to support their families and their and their students at home as they learn. Thank you. Thank you. We also distributed many of our families now that we were going virtual with our parent advisory group meetings. Um, they could get a computer to, to participate. We did Zoom classes with them to help them get even Gmail. I know the Parent Center did that. Um, gosh, there's so many. I mean, a, a hotline for parents. So in case parents had questions about their computer, they didn't know how to navigate that. They could call and get help, homework help, um, hotline um gosh all kinds of stuff i can't eat I, <laughs> it's like a blur really great. i appreciate your your long list of things i those are many i heard many things that i have heard uh, parents and community organizers talk about as some sort of nuts and bolts types of things and at the state level we worked really hard to advocate for things as simple as access to a place to study and uh, I know that I did some advocacy at some local districts to say, please consider, you know, sending desks out to some of your families that don't have places for children to study. And I just wonder um, where you're going to share that information so that that gets disseminated as not just quote best practice, but practice that makes sense. I mean, um, there at, did actually seem to be some resistance to that just that small request about desks, which I thought was unwarranted. <laughs> anyway, uh, I, I want to make sure that your experience uh, does not go unused. Yes, um, well, the, Dr. Hammond, he, Dr. Hammond, um, James Hammond, he is our superintendent and uh, it has removed any barrier you, like remove, identify it, remove it, um, because that's just what we do. And so, yes, principals were getting guests and helping them load in the car and we'll worry about the, the details later type of thing um, because it's just what needed to happen. And so um, I'll take that back as well to our, um, to, to our Tammy Lipschultz, our assistant superintendent, and I'm sure that they would love to share more about all the, they really, this district has done amazing things for our families. I think, you know, maybe a question, I don't know if maybe since Tony's here and, and we have had our parents, a kind of a good thing that's come out of all the, all that, all this tragedy that's happened over the years is our, our families have really taken up the charge and they are becoming, they have become so savvy about teaching and they're asking questions like pedagogy and gradual release and our parent, our project to inspire parents are rocking it they are leading other parents everyone has just kind of um all hands on deck and have help helping parents are really like taking initiative and helping other parents um with those um inequities i i don't know if uh, if there's any questions around that because like we do have tony here and um and somebody that's worked with our project to inspire level four parents and so i don't know if, if anyone I have a I have a question just really quickly. It's kind of connected to what you were just talking about. 
So you have your, your problem of practice with cultural proficiency and have began the work on how to diffuse that throughout your district. Um, is there a plan for that to touch your parents as well? So, you know, you're talking about you're having your parent leaders who are rocking it, you know, um, but are they a part of that process in which they need to understand the importance of cultural proficiency and be a part of that, you know, so that in the in the greater community that actually works, right? And if they're, you know, we already know that the peer teaching is effective and that's gonna be effective on all levels, whether it be academic, whether it be, you know, leadership skills or whether it is talking about the importance of cultural proficiency. And, you know, and a lot of times it's our parents who can be the most resistant to it. So I don't know if you have a plan for, to include them in this process. Yeah, I'm going to put um, Arlene Rodriguez, a member of our team, on the spot. <laughs> she can talk from our site perspective. I definitely can. Um, the, when, whenever we do anything, including um, how we're, we're going to start... Um, I guess imparting this this big initiative of cultural proficiency, uh, it's it's never just an administrative, it's never just a district, a, it's never just even a single school site. It always gets embraced with the idea of community, so it is going to involve every, um, in, including our community members, which means our parents. Um, I'm since I'm at the school site, um, we have that, that um, it's very critical for us to always involve our parents in every aspect of, um, of the work that we're doing because um, it's, it's not only the immediate school site that is going to be affected, it's going to be the community at large, it's going to be our families, it's going to be their students. So the plan is always inclusive of everyone. Um, and yes, Ms. as Lisette said, we are in the beginning stage, state, um, stages of creating the plan. This year was a lot of discussion in terms of um, which frameworks, which um, strategies, how it was going to, um, how it was going, how, I mean, developing our goals um, for the different parts, including that community goal that she mentioned. Um, so yes, we are in those beginning st stages, but it always includes everyone, including our parents, because they um, usually end up being our biggest voices and our biggest advocates within the district. And we are very intentional on making sure that we are not only um, bringing in our mainstream parents to um, disseminate this information, we're very intentional of bringing our um, our parents who usually are our parents that um, represent our um, socially disadvantaged, our low income, those are the parents that we really tap into because um, they need to be the models and the leaders for our parents because that's who our population feels most comfortable with. Looks like we're at time. Thank you so much. Let's give a big hand to Ontario Montclair. Thank you. It's an honor to be with all of you. Thank you.